I'm reading this morning from uh, Romans 14, verses 1 through 9. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who, the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special, so does the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So I couldn't stand it that I've got one here who hadn't been involved in my family yet, so I'm going to bring Jacob up here. Come here, Jake. I asked him to do this last night, and he first thing he said to me is, I ain't saying nothing, so come here. So I promised him he wouldn't have to. I just want him to come up here with me as we open in prayer. So y'all pray with me. Father God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you for who we are because of you. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us. God, I thank you personally for my family, and I thank you for the gifts and talents that they bring, and I thank you for just the fine people that they're growing into. Father, I pray that you would be with us in the next few moments. I pray that anything that I say gets put aside, and the only thing that remains is what you intend. And Father, I give this to you. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So you didn't have to do anything. <laughs> Sierra sang that, uh, that song a few weeks ago at my father's church. <clears throat> and I, it just had to happen today. And I, I don't know about you, but if you heard the words of that song, aren't they appropriate for right now? My goodness. What a world we're in. Division everywhere and all that kind of thing. But I wanted to start this because, and this is another talk for another time, because I could go into a lot of detail about this, but this is the first sermon I've preached in 14 years. And I didn't think about that until uh, Lamar asked me, and I got to thinking about it, and it's been a long time. And that journey, like I say, is its own, is its own talk. And I don't mind giving it because of what God's brought me through and where God's brought me from then until now. But uh, I'm honored beyond belief to be able to stand in front of people that I love and care about uh, to be able to deliver this. I, as I was thinking about what to talk about, um, <laughs> Lamar, Lamar asked to send a message that said, we need to know a title for the sermon. And so I gave him one. And uh, I don't, if you saw it, you might be as confused as Lamar was. Uh, the title of the sermon is Tomato, Tomato. <laughs> And uh, he asked this morning, he said, well, I'm, I still want to know what that's about. I'll tell you in a minute. I'll tell you in a little while. But I want to start with a story that I remember Barry telling uh, years ago. And it was so long ago that Barry didn't even remember telling it. Which is funny considering Barry remembers everything. But uh, this was apparently true. And it's unbelievable if it's true. But it's from the 1890s and it's in Mayfield County, Kentucky. There was a church there with a pastor who wore a hat um, pretty regularly. 
And as the story goes, there was a deacon in the church that decided that the pastor needed a peg to hang his hat on when he came in the church building. And so being a good, thoughtful deacon like he was, he went and he got a peg and he nailed it up in the church entryway so the pastor could hang his hat. Well, there was another deacon who saw this peg, figured out exactly who that deacon was and was incensed and angry that this deacon would hang a peg without consulting him. And so he took the peg down. The first deacon saw that the peg was down. Now he's angry and knew exactly who it was who did this. They got into a war and that war spread to the church. The church picked sides and the church split over a peg. Now, as I remember the story, I want to say that Barry said that somebody took him to these two churches and in one church, there were pegs all over the wall <laughs> at this point. All the men started wearing hats and they hung pegs everywhere. And they called it Peg Church. You go down the road a little ways and guess what? There's a church that says, no Peg Church. Now, I don't know if those churches are actually called that verbally, you know, or, or technically or whatever, but what a silly thing, right? I mean, how silly is it to be divided over something so pointless? so not related to the important things. But before we get too, uh, too morally superior to that, I want to do one thing. I want to show you something. I'm just going to say two words, and I want you to watch what happens. War Eagle. There it is. There it went. See? It doesn't take any long. We do it. We all do that. It's just what we do. So the reason I told you about my the 14 years since the last time I preached is because Romans 14 during this 14 year time has had a lot to do with my transition into the things that I, I now believe and the way I tend to operate. Uh, without getting too deep into that, I was a 35 year old man, completely full of myself, um, completely convinced that I was right and completely convinced that I was going to turn this bunch of people that I was pastoring around. And it didn't work out that way. And uh, so I spent 14 years basically in the wilderness. But what Romans 14 over the years has taught me is that just because I feel right doesn't mean that I necessarily am right. The other thing it taught me is sometimes I am right. And it really just doesn't matter all that much because so is the other person. And that's kind of what I want to get into with Romans 14. Uh, my dad would tell me now... <laughs> He used to tell me, That's, this is not a Bible, and I understand that. So those of you who have a Bible, you can turn to Romans 14 if you want to and, and follow along. But it starts out with this. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now I'm going to stop there for a second. Pat was supposed to be here this morning. I told Pat a month ago I was going to burn on him a little bit because he and I get along this way. And the first thing I was thinking is, Pat's a vegetarian. And Pat, if you're listening, whose faith is weak? Those who eat only vegetables. No. I'm not saying it. This is what God says. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But... That gets into something with Pat and I. And uh, Pat and I have, have developed a really good relationship over the last few years. And we don't agree on everything. We don't. Pat uh, believes in Reformed theology, um, predestination and all that kind of stuff. And I don't generally ascribe to that. So I don't. Uh, Pat eats only vegetables. I do not. Although, Pat, again, if you're listening, I saw you eat that hamburger at the Dempsey's Fourth of July celebration, you hypocrite. So, <laughs> Pat's an Alabama fan. Some of you in here are. I am not. And what that means in the bottom line is that Pat is wrong, and I am not. Pat's not wrong. Not all the time. <laughs> but it does get into the, the thing of all those things that I talked about, those things that we disagree on, those are all disputable matters, right? So what are those? And we want to talk about what those disputable matters are and what they are not. 
So here we go. You want to know the explanation for the title of the sermon? Here it is. There was an old Broadway song years and years ago, and some of you remember this, and I may be dating myself, uh, called Let's Call the Whole Thing Off. Anybody remember that song? It starts off, you say tomato, I say tomato, you say potato, I say potato, 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 tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off. You remember that? It's a cute little song, cute little ditty, meant to be fun and light and all that. But think about what was said just in, what, just in that verse. You say this this way, I say it that way. You say this this way, I say it that way. To heck with it. Let's just call it off. Isn't that a silly, silly reason to call off or hurt a relationship between one person and another one? Isn't it? It's silly to do that over a song or over the way you pronounce a word or over a peg or over your allegiance to a football team. Well, maybe that's not so silly, but it is. Or our personal convictions. And personal convictions are what the disputable matters really are. Now, explain a little bit about what Paul is talking about, because he seems to spend a lot of time over eating and drinking in this passage, right? The context of that is this. He's speaking to the Romans. He's in Rome. Romans were, by and large, polytheists. They had very many gods. And when you were offering meat, offering a, a, an animal sacrifice to your god, it was generally frowned, up, frowned upon to give them the worst cut, right? You're going to give the, your deity the best cut of meat, right? And so what they would do is the best cut of meat usually in Rome, in the marketplace, had been sacrificed to a false deity, to a, a god. There were those like Paul who says in this body of scripture that that's fine. It's no big deal because there is no God but God. There's no God but Jehovah. It's fine. But there are others, and I don't want to get hung up on the idea about those who are weak in faith. I know I made fun of, of, of uh, Pat a little while ago with that. But weak faith does not necessarily mean weak faith. It means undeveloped. So we're talking about people who have not developed their faith fully yet. People who are at the beginning end of the spectrum of the Christian walk who just haven't lived long enough to understand that that's okay. Or they've developed a set of convictions where that's just where they're going to stay. That's where they're going to be. And what Paul's saying with this is that there's stuff used in these rituals. Well, you know what? I thought about this, Lynn, and I'm going to use Tyler as an example. Let's say, Tyler, you go into Tyler's store tomorrow, and there is a Boston butt, and it's beautiful. But it has a sticker on there that says this meat was sacrificed to a false god. Lest we think too little of these people, would you buy it? I don't know. It changes things when it hits home, right? Now, I don't think Tyler would ever do that. But it changes things when we make it personal, when we get down close to home with that. So what does Scripture teach is the answer? Well, it's found in the body of, of Paul's teaching here. And he says this, each should be convinced in his own mind. Not really much of an answer if you think about it. He's kind of toe in the middle of the line. We want an answer. We want to know who's right and who's not, especially in the world we live in now. Give us the line on who's right. Well, why do we need to know whether or not we're right or we're wrong? Mostly it's because we, so we can have a weapon to beat the other side up, right? Right? It's goofy. It's goofy that we get torn up over all these things that are not the main thing. But I'll get to that in a minute. What does each should be convinced in his own mind mean? To me, it means follow your conscience on that. Let them follow their conscience on that. And the implication is, and be quiet about it. It's not that big of a deal. It's just not that important to fight over. It's why it's called a disputable matter, right? Now, for all the things that are disputable matters, there are some things that are indisputable, correct? There are some things that we have got to hold on to and hold to and not separate ourselves from that are core and important. Obviously, the crucifixion, resurrection, life, death, and teachings of Jesus Christ and what he did for us that's, that's indisputable. We can't have a dispute over that and have a Christian church, right? We can't do that. 
In the Gospels, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, Satan tried to tempt Jesus to turn stones into bread. Jesus referred to the prophet when he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, right? So it's not just Jesus' life and death and, and the cross and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes we get too hung up on the cross and not enough on the rest of it. It's every word that comes from the mouth of God. Everything Jesus taught is indisputable. Since Jesus is God, everything God taught is indisputable. From the foundation to now through whenever God stops speaking, which is never going to happen, right? He doesn't, he doesn't stop. Those things are indisputable. We don't argue over those. We can't argue over those. If we do argue over those, we have, we have a problem. We do. But we also have a problem if we start arguing over disputable matters and we start dividing over those things. Like the silliness about dividing over a peg on a wall in a church. Churches have divided over dumb things for years. The color of the carpet. You know, that's not a thing that is common in sermons because it's, un it's unique. It happens all the time. Or it wouldn't be a thing that, that, that pastors use. What kind of clothes you wear what kind of music you listen to, whether you choose to give it to Operation Crosschild or Compassion International. Okay, that's what Paul is saying. Okay, do that. Do that. And what, what did Paul say about what we might think of that if we don't agree? This, stop passing judgment on each other over that kind of thing. And this one too. Don't throw it in your brother or sister's face. Now, does he say don't throw it in their face? No, he doesn't. But he says it this way. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. There's some wiggle room, in other words, with these disputable matters. And with those, that wiggle room, it goes into the person's personal convictions and what the person thinks. Whatever you believe about this or that, if it winds up being the category of disputable matters, Paul just says, fine. Whatever you believe about that, be convinced in your mind, do it that way. Whatever you believe over here about that thing, be convinced in your mind and do it that way. There was a lot of arguing and fighting over the meat, sacrifice to the idols and things like that. But it's so much more than that now. We've got so many more things where with a lot of scripture, just like with most scripture, if it was true then, it's true now, but expanded to encompass more of what's going on in our world. He ends Romans 14 with these words. Whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And listen to this. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. If you really let that sink in, it makes you go, ow, oh, okay. Then you start to wonder, what have I done here? Well, what does it mean? Whatever does not come from faith is sin. Well, it means simply this. We sin when we act against our God-infused conscience. We sin when we insist others act against their God-infused conscience. We sin when we create a roadblock of any kind that keeps people from honoring their Savior in their own way according to the dictates of their God-infused conscience. We sin when we cause a brother or sister to stumble. That's what that is. So if we keep it to the meat and drink sort of thing, it means if you're a vegetarian and I invite you to my house to eat, I am not acting in love if I throw T-bones on the grill. And you have a moral opposition to that. Is it okay? Yeah, I eat steaks all the time. I love them. Is it okay if I do that in the presence of somebody? Let's, let's get closer to home with, the whole, with, with some Baptist theology. Is it okay for me to have a glass of wine in front of somebody who is morally opposed to that? No. 
Is it okay for me to? That's debatable. That is a disputable question. Drunkenness is a sin. Never, the scripture never teaches that drinking is necessarily a sin, but drunkenness always is. But if someone is going, look, I'm a reformed alcoholic. I'm trying to get my life right. How insensitive do I have to be in order to pop a top when they're there? That's insensitive, right? That's not acting in love. I'll, I'll get it closer to home for me. There are some of these things I can't hide. I, I tried to, especially one back here. I always forget it's back here. When I was going through my uh, uh, reclaiming my youth phase, midlife crisis stuff, I didn't buy a motorcycle. I bought ink on my arms and stuff. And there are a lot more, and you've seen those. And, and it grieves my mother and father to death. It does. And they're going to hear this later and be embarrassed that I brought that up. But it does. But it's why I don't wear sleeveless shirts to their home. It's not that I have a problem with what's on me. That's fine. But I'm not acting in love if I walk around shirtless or with a sleeveless shirt on and say, hey, did you see that? Look at that. Look at that. That's, that's not acting in love. It's perfectly fine. But it's not cool. It's not good. It's not right. When I start making other people toe my line when it's a disputable line. Churches don't split over indisputable matters much. I don't, in some big cases they do. They get into, the, into things that are indisputable and they have to do something. And at those points and times, you have to stand. Most of the time when churches have issues, it's over a disputable matter. Right? We argue over things. If we really thought about it in the big picture, are not that big of a picture. It's what we do. It's unfortunate. It's also human nature. There are indisputable matters, again, that can, cannot be made disputable, and we cannot allow that to happen. We have to stand firm and stand tall. A friend of mine used to look at it this way. He said, in matters that are indisputable, you hold those in a closed fist. You don't let anybody pull those out. In matters of disputable things, an open hand. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, this is what I think about that, but... At the end of the day, it's okay. We have to let people have the freedom to worship and honor God in the way that instructs, instructs them, especially in disputable matters, or, and, and stand together on the things that are unchangeable. When, when people get at odds with one another, and it really it goes back to why I love that song Sierra sings, hey, here's, here's a little tidbit about that song if you want to know the truth. You know who wrote that? A Mormon. Uh-oh! We just had a Mormon song in a Baptist church. Did you hear anything bad in that song? Anything negative or that you would disagree with? No. Oh. So while I might have some indisputable disagreements with someone of a different faith, I do not have an indisputable disagreement with them over that song. And so I let that go. One of my favorite stories in all the scriptures is when Paul went up to Mars Hill, right? And he's up there arguing with the philosophers, uh, the Socrates type people and all that kind of stuff. And on Mars Hill is, are all the monuments to all these gods. And Paul has got to be a little uncomfortable by that because he knows that those are not real. That's really kind of out of place. But he sees one and it says to the unknown God. And what Paul does right there is just brilliant. He doesn't say, all these gods are fake, they're false. I'm going to tell you about the one true God, and it's this one, it's not all these. How many people would he have turned off right there at that moment? Most of them. He just said, hey guys, that unknown God, I know him. And if you'll give me a few minutes, I'll tell you about him. That's brilliant. That's letting things go in order to bridge a gap between people over things that would otherwise divide. Now, that is a clear line of division. False gods and all that kind of stuff. But even there, Paul is navigating that in a way to get an ear. They, they have seen this as an unknown god. For, and it's just, it, all that means is to the one we might have missed. That's what the Greeks did. If we happen to miss one, we don't want to tick him off, so... 
here, here's a monument to whoever that might be. But here's the thing, we have one banner, we know this. One banner, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We have clear teachings. And other than that, Paul says here, give people the room to live according to their conscience. We have got to be united under the right banner. We will go to war under all sorts of crazy banners that are not the right one. We've got to stop doing that. We've got to stop doing that as a church and model that to the rest of the world because right now the rest of the world has gone nuts. I don't need to say that. You already know it. Social media is full of people just at loggerheads. They used to share pictures of your kids and vacations and stuff. Oh, not anymore. No. It's all about that ridiculous P word. Politics, right? You know what? There are some of you in this room that do not agree with me politically. You know how much I care in this room? Not a whit. I don't care. Because when you walk in the door back there, that stuff should stop. Cold. Because it's about Jesus and him crucified, resurrected, and in our hearts and lives that matters. The rest of that junk doesn't matter a whit and shouldn't be a part of what we do as a church. And that's just the bottom and top of it. That is not our banner. If we carry that banner into a war, we are fighting a war for no reason. We're going to have casualties for no reason. Hurt feelings for no reason. Because it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. Christ and him crucified. Verse 17 says this. It says the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. I'll go further. It's not about right or left. The kingdom of God is not about this or that. It's not about where your money goes. It's not about any. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. Now, if we're fighting over ancillary things like that, can we have righteousness peace and joy in the spirit? No. We have conflict. We have people at each other's throats. This is a church that I knew about 30 some odd years ago when I came here as a student and Barry was here and the phrase was always there's just something about Williams. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a little personal now and I mean to. Um, uh, I want that phrase to mean that again. I, I do. And one of the things I think that we were always known for is above all else, not everybody in here ever agreed. It just didn't happen. But there was a love that went beyond all that. And I think we've kind of forgotten our first love with that. I think we've gotten in the weeds with some things that just don't matter. They just don't matter. What matters is that I love the folks in this church. There's not a person I'm looking at right now that I don't have a, a soft spot in my heart for. Just not. And I don't want to see that. I don't want to see these stupid ancillary things become dividing points anymore. Peace, joy, and righteousness in the Spirit. Christ and Him crucified. Let's get under that banner and get out from underneath all these others. Can you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your words. I thank you for men who have gone before us who have written words under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit down so that eons later we can stand here and they still ring true today. Father, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for these people, which is what the church is in the first place. And God, I thank you that we have one banner, one faith, one baptism. We, I thank you that we have one singular thing that we are to be united under. And God, I pray that you would forgive me for the moments where I have gotten in the weeds with things that don't matter. I pray that you would forgive me for the times where I have divided over things that don't matter. I pray that you would give me the grace, God, to let people live their lives the way they need to under the banner of Christ and him crucified and all that that means. I pray that we would learn to live at peace with one another so long as 
the indisputables are firm in our grasp and the disputables are in an open palm. Father, I love you and I thank you for everything that you've done. And I thank you for what you're going to do yet in the, in the life of this church. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.